Hong Kong, once a beacon of freedom, prosperity, and democracy in East Asia, has become a police state under the boot of the Chinese Communist Party. This greatly contrasts with the hopes of Hong Kongers over 25 years ago, when the United Kingdom handed over its last colony over to the People's Republic of China. Hong Kong had become a unique blend of East and West. Hong Kong is not a nation, it's a hyphenation. Its colonial past, rather than something violently resisted, is something embraced. Colonialism pioneered methods of incorporating pre-capitalist, pre-industrial, and non-European societies into the world economy and found ways of dealing with ethnically, racially, and culturally different societies. The story of Hong Kong's descent into its current state is well documented, and so here I want to tell you the story about how Hong Kong was peacefully transferred and the shortcomings that came along with it. The story begins in the early 19th century toward the end of the Napoleonic Wars. The British first expressed an interest in acquiring territory along the eastern coast of China in 1815, but the island of Hong Kong wasn't identified until 1836, when the Canton Register said, If the lion's paw is to be put down on any part of the south side of China, let it be Hong Kong. Let the lion declare it to be under his guarantee a free port, and in 10 years it will be the most considerable market east of the Cape. Hong Kong deep water, and a free port forever. The territory that now makes up Hong Kong was acquired in phases. The island of Hong Kong itself was acquired during the First Opium War. The British occupied the island in 1841, which had a population of about 2,500 people. The British force that landed consisted not only of Britons, but also Indians, Arabs, and Jewish merchants from Baghdad. The war ended with the Treaty of Nanking, in which the island of Hong Kong was given to Britain in perpetuity, along with five ports along the coast being open to British trade. The area south of Kowloon was acquired by the First Treaty of Peking in 1860, with the Second Treaty of Peking leasing the rest of Kowloon to Britain in 1898 for 99 years. This last chunk of land accounts for over 90% of Hong Kong's territory. Hong Kong attracted entrepreneurs from around the world. The British would export their goods into China through Hong Kong, which was subject to different rules than the rest of Chinese ports. And the British practiced a light hand in regulating its economy. Robert Cottrell would refer to Hong Kong as Britons liberated from the obligations of Britain and Chinese liberated from the obligations of China. Hong Kong primarily functioned as a sieve for goods entering mainland China until World War II, when it suffered during the Japanese occupation with ships preoccupied moving soldiers and war goods, with food shortages leading to hunger and starvation. Before the war, Hong Kong was home to 1.6 million people, but by 1945, that had gone down to 600,000. The Japanese attempted to incite a race war, but the brutality and material deprivation of Japanese rule made this impossible. By the end of the war, a sizable number of non-white people in Hong Kong identified as British, and after the war, they sought to establish a higher status and greater cooperation with Britain. One such person was Dr. Douglas Lang, who in 1942 wrote a memo describing the Eurasians of Hong Kong as natives of the colony. Many of them are third and fourth generation descendants of the earliest British settlers. They have always borne a strong loyalty to Britain. This loyalty has always been taken for granted, and proof of it has been given in times of emergency. The Cold War brought additional fears to Hong Kong. China's intervention into the Korean War stoked panic of imminent invasion. When that failed to materialize, the embargoes placed on China by the US and its allies made many fear that Hong Kong would suffer due to mainland China being its main supplier of food and fresh water. Despite this, goods still crossed the border between China and Hong Kong, though at a lower volume than before the war, which gave its domestic industries a boost, especially manufacturing. Many businessmen and entrepreneurs from Shanghai and other major Chinese cities arrived in Hong Kong after the communists took over, but the arrival of refugees from China resulted in large squatter camps that tended to catch fire. I knew the dark side of that story, the opium wars and unequal treaties, but I also knew that the Chinese who lived in the shacks on those hillsides were not a subject race longing to be free. They had fled there within the last five years, escaping from upheaval and persecution in China, seeking order and the rule of law. Vice President Richard Nixon visited Hong Kong in the 1950s, and a local leader told him that if given a chance, the Hong Kongers would have voted for independence from Britain at the time. I saw how the leaders and the masses of Asia longed for independence, whether or not they were ready for it, and whether or not they really understood it, because for them it meant dignity and respect. It meant being taken seriously and treated decently, and that was what they wanted. 
Hong Kong would become functionally autonomous in 1958 under Governor Sir Robert Black, with the Legislative Council taking over control of domestic policy, leaving London in control of foreign affairs. During the Great Famine, Hong Kong became a lifeline for Communist China. A third of China's foreign trade went to Hong Kong. China then used these foreign currencies to import food. So despite being militarily capable of conquering Hong Kong, they allowed it to remain in British hands, knowing that foreign trade would dry up if they forcibly took over. But this trade also posed a threat to Hong Kong. Refugees from the famine overwhelmed Hong Kong's colonial government, not having enough housing for them. When the Cultural Revolution broke out in China, CCP activists and thugs in Hong Kong incited protests and riots, which many feared was a prelude to a Chinese invasion. The 1960s and 70s saw Hong Kong, as well as other East Asian countries, begin following Japan's economic model in order to replicate the Japanese economic miracle, which you can learn more about in this previous video. These countries, later dubbed the Asian Tigers, sought to increase their industrial capacity and fuel economic growth through exports. By the 1980s, Hong Kong had a nearly 0% unemployment rate with 10% annual GDP growth and began moving away from manufacturing and toward financial services. In fact, they had begun outsourcing much of their manufacturing to mainland China, which in the post-Mao era was opening up economically. Hong Kong's economic growth was so impressive that it became a center of fascination for economists around the world, so much so that it became a major point of attention in Milton Friedman's 1980 book and TV series, Free to Choose. During the mid-20th century, while Hong Kong was thriving, China was suffering the unrestrained vision of Mao Zedong. As mentioned earlier, China refused to invade Hong Kong because it was dependent on trade with it to import food. This goes even further because back in 1967, Portugal offered to hand Macau back over to China ahead of its own leases lapse. But the CCP refused to accept it because they knew Macau was more valuable to them in the hands of a foreign power than in their own. The modern relationship between Hong Kong and mainland China has been referred to as one country, two systems. This formulation is usually credited to Deng Xiaoping, but Western analysts were postulating such an arrangement in the early 1970s. The United States should ponder the cost and gain for the international community were Peking induced to progress toward a one China dual economic system. It's around this time that Nixon is opening up China, who was beginning to assert its way in world affairs. As non-communist countries around the world began opening up relations with China, the CCP began asserting what would later be known as the One China Policy, in which China would tell foreign countries that they couldn't have relations with both Taiwan and China. Even the U.S. would acquiesce to these demands with the Taiwan Relations Act of 1979. What it insists upon for the immediate future is the defeat of Chiang diplomatically, an end to American intervention in the Chinese Civil War, and recognition of China's territorial integrity in principle. Once the principle is acknowledged, if only tacitly, Peking can be expected to behave in a flexible manner toward Taiwan, just as it has toward Hong Kong and Macau. The British would also begin making inroads with China in the 1970s, having waited for the U.S. to break the ice first. Prime Minister Edward Heath would visit China in 1974, and in his memoirs he claims to have broached the subject of Hong Kong, though I haven't read any other accounts confirming this. I want the handover of Hong Kong to the mainland when the treaty expires in 1997 to be smooth and peaceful, in the interests of both our countries. Mao says that he will not be alive by the time the treaty expires, but that another man in the room, Wang Hongwen, aged 39, would be. You and Mr. Heath will still be here to see the smooth handover of Hong Kong. That handover has now taken place, albeit with the few tricky moments on the way, and Wang is dead. Heath was always a bit of a Sinophile, having opposed the Second Churchill's government's decision to diplomatically isolate Communist China. Relations continued to open up further throughout the 70s. In 1978, Prime Minister Callahan oversaw a seven-year economic agreement that reopened direct flights between Hong Kong and mainland China for the first time since 1949. And in 1979, the governor of Hong Kong, Sir Marassi Maclehose, met with Deng Xiaoping and brought up the fast approaching end of the 1898 lease. China did not seem initially in a hurry to have Hong Kong return to them, but the Falklands War had internally provoked Deng to get the Hong Kong issue settled, fearing what a militarily reinvigorated Britain might be willing to do. Thatcher's government wanted some kind of continuing link between Hong Kong and Great Britain, be it administration or whatever. However, there was another diplomatic issue. 
Hong Kong was acquired in three treaties. The third, which leased Kowloon to the British, was to expire in 1997. But the 1841 Treaty of Nanking gave the island of Hong Kong itself to the British in perpetuity, which all previous British governments fully held on to. But the Chinese Communist Party, decrying the agreements as part of the unequal treaties, did not recognize their legitimacy, and during the negotiations made it clear that they allowed the British to continue running Hong Kong out of respect and convenience. But Thatcher wanted to emphasize the perpetuity of ownership granted by the Nanking Treaty, but not out of some deep desire to perpetually control Hong Kong. Thatcher, as well as her predecessors, knew very well that if China wanted to take Hong Kong back, there was nothing the UK could do short of nuclear war to stop them. Thatcher's strategy was to leverage the claim of perpetual control to get a better deal in the handover negotiations. At the initial negotiations in September 1982, Thatcher was unwilling to allow anything greater than titular sovereignty over Hong Kong. Deng would not accept this, and said he was willing to wait till either Thatcher calmed down, or a more amenable Prime Minister was in office. Initially, Thatcher had wanted to maintain confidentiality over the details of negotiations in order to prevent disorder in Hong Kong, but in an interview with the BBC after that meeting, she said, I believe the treaties are valid in international law, and if countries try to abrogate treaties like that, it is very serious indeed, because if a country will not stand by one treaty, it will not stand by another. She met with Zhao Jiang on September 22, 1982, mostly discussing world events. On the 23rd, they would discuss Hong Kong, in which Thatcher laid out the British argument that the continued economic success of Hong Kong was dependent on good administration, which was guaranteed under the British. If a significant change in policy was announced prior to the handover, a massive flight in capital might occur. Thatcher didn't want to consider handing sovereignty of Hong Kong over to China until they had an agreement on administration. But Jiang's position was that China would not compromise on sovereignty over the entirety of Hong Kong. Jiang did say that Hong Kong would remain largely unchanged, with its economic system left in place as well as its own separate currency. He responded to the concern over capital flights by saying that they cared more about sovereignty than prosperity. And he responded to the concern over capital flight, saying that they cared more about sovereignty than prosperity. Thatcher would meet with Deng on September 24, 1982. Deng told Thatcher that they didn't need to announce the return of Chinese sovereignty right away, but that in one or two years, they would. Thatcher insisted that she wanted an agreement on continued British administration over Hong Kong after 1997, but Deng was unpersuaded. At one point, he said the Chinese could walk in and take Hong Kong later today if they wanted to. I retorted that they could indeed do so. I could not stop them, but this would bring about Hong Kong's collapse. The world would then see what followed a change from British to Chinese rule. Deng tells Thatcher that her government should simply stop capital flight from Hong Kong, but Thatcher tells him that this would also dissuade new capital from coming in. The Chinese, believing their own slogans about the evils of colonialism, just did not realize that we in Britain considered we had a moral duty to do our best to protect the free way of life of the people of Hong Kong. Thatcher and the government were not confident about China's assurances over Hong Kong. She accused them of holding up negotiations, and when she asked Henry Kissinger for advice, he told her that's just the way the Chinese do things. After the meeting, the Chinese government responded with a propaganda campaign. All the while, the Hong Kong stock market fell by 25% and the Hong Kong dollar fell by 12%. She had a meeting with the cabinet and the governor of Hong Kong in January 1983. They had discovered that back in June 1982, the Chinese had considered unilaterally announcing their plans for Hong Kong. In response, Thatcher's government decided to start developing democratic institutions in Hong Kong by devolving power and preparing it for independence. However, between the cabinet's disapproval and China's overwhelming military power, she shelved this option. She would then send a letter to Xiong in March of 1983. Provided that agreement could be reached between the British and Chinese government on administrative arrangements for Hong Kong, which would guarantee the future prosperity and stability of Hong Kong, and would be acceptable to the British Parliament and to the people of Hong Kong, as well as to the Chinese government, I would be prepared to recommend to Parliament that sovereignty over the whole of Hong Kong should revert to China. The talks began breaking down again in September 1983, in which the Chinese said that they would allow a high degree of autonomy, but not any continued British link. Jeffrey Howe meets with Wu Xuxian and Zhao Nan, the foreign and assistant foreign ministers of China while at the UN. Zhu Xuan had served in the anti-Japanese resistance, and Zhao Nan had been an interrogator during the Korean War. 
Howe told Wu that the British didn't have any confidence in a handover that didn't retain some kind of British administration. While Wu said that China was willing to let Britain play a great role in Hong Kong after the handover, but only if they willingly reverted all administrative control. Sir Chung encouraged Howe and the British government to call China's bluff, and he was supported in this view by Hong Kong's governor, Teddy Yaud. Opposing them were the China Hands of London, such as Percy Craddock, who along with Howe and Richard Luce, agreed that the Chinese were not bluffing. Edward Heath visited China again in 1983, where Deng Xiaoping told him he wanted the discussions over the handover finished in 1984. Heath describes Deng's associates in the room as being nervous and listening to him closely. Deng says to Heath, A year has already passed, and we have got nowhere at all. When you get home, go and tell Mrs. Thatcher that there is only one more year left for us to settle these affairs. If she has not done so with me before another year is up, I shall settle it entirely on my own. After the September 1983 talks, no progress had been made. At each of the previous meetings, they had publicly announced the date of the next. But after the September meetings, no future meeting was announced. Thatcher again considered preparing Hong Kong to declare independence. This, combined with a Chinese propaganda campaign, triggered a capital flight out of Hong Kong, which destabilized the Hong Kong dollar. And to restabilize it, Thatcher and the Bank of England decided to peg it to the US dollar, which managed to stabilize the currency market. By the end of October 1983, Thatcher more or less came to admit that nothing she or her government could do could prevent China from getting Hong Kong back, and nothing they could do could successfully prepare them for independence. Talks would resume, and Thatcher told the Chinese that although they would be more confident if the British could continue administering Hong Kong, they were open to hearing China's proposals. However, the CCP were reluctant to give any details about their future plans. They were insistent that all negotiations needed to be finished by September 1984. Negotiations were resumed in February 1984. Around this time, Howe and Thatcher met with Exco in London, explaining that either they arrange some kind of deal with China, or the CCP gets everything with no stipulations in 1997. There was an international price to be paid if he simply took over without regard for the prosperity and system of Hong Kong, but I now had to accept that China's concern for its international good name would allow us only so much latitude. The UK government began considering giving all government workers and their families in Hong Kong free entry into the UK up through 1997. Howe and the Hong Kong governor went to Beijing in April of 1984 to push negotiations forward. The Chinese controlled the itinerary and never let the British see it beforehand. Howe would meet with Ji Peng Fei, the head of the Hong Kong and Macau Affairs Office, and Premier Zhao Xiong. Chinese negotiators didn't like speaking in specific details, but rather in metaphors. Howe and Deng wouldn't meet until the last day of their scheduled trip. By this point, Howe had made provisional agreements with Wu, Ji, and Zhao about a timetable. Howe explained the agreements he had made, and Deng explained his conception of one country, two systems. Deng spoke slowly as if he were grasping for the right words. After shaking Howe's hands as if they were in agreement, he said that after the British withdrawal, the Chinese would station a small garrison of troops to replace the departing British ones, which upset Howe and his delegation. Deng's forgetfulness struck me as an attempt to slip in a really fastball at the very end of our talk. I responded vigorously, we do not dispute your right to do that, but it would help confidence greatly if you were to refrain from doing so. After the meetings with Deng, Howe is rushed to Hong Kong in order to explain the details of the negotiations with the various parties. One Exco member told Howe, Very often, all you can actually do is rearrange the cards in the Chinese hand, for they hold them all. In May 1984, Howe would hear Parliament's reactions to the negotiations. They responded with strong assertions to intensify efforts to secure Hong Kong's future. Talks in Beijing were ongoing, but it looked as though they were beginning to stall. Deng had verbally abused representatives from Hong Kong and Macau, asserting that China would be stationing troops there after the handover. After this, Howe decided he needed to return to Beijing. His top priority was finalizing a time and place for a joint commission to begin working. Zhao agreed to the British proposals for the Joint Commission to defer its arrival in Hong Kong until 1987, and to extend its life until the year 2000. Howe relayed this to Thatcher, Howe relayed this to Thatcher, who asked if they could delay it till 1990. Howe was able to get Zhao to accept 1988, which Thatcher was willing to accept. Howe then met with Deng, who told him that the Japanese and American governments had agreed to continue investing in Hong Kong. There's no need to bother about all the other less important countries, Indians and people like that. 
Capital will only come in if Hong Kong retains its magnetism, and that magnetism to attract capital depends on continuing freedom for capital to move away again. Nothing said by American or Japanese governments can achieve that, but only what actually happens in Hong Kong. That's what our agreement is all about. A final agreement was drafted, but how needed to present it to Hong Kong in Parliament. The Exco were surprisingly supportive of the deal. Howe also got Zhao to agree to allowing Hong Kong's Legislative Council after 1997 to be composed of elected officials, and that the executive of Hong Kong would be accountable to them. The final text was completed on September 19, 1984. Howe, Thatcher, Governor Teddy Yaud, Exco, and the cabinet met to discuss it and approved it unanimously on September 20th. The agreement was signed by Zhao Nan in Beijing on the 26th, but another 12 years would pass before the handover was completed and other issues threatened to derail the process. In the late 80s, there was a massive surge in refugees fleeing Vietnam, colloquially referred to as the Boat People. By 1989, nearly 150,000 were living in camps around Hong Kong, with 31,000 having arrived in the year prior. And Hong Kong couldn't house them all, and many refused to go back to Vietnam. The Chinese blamed the British for this and demanded that they fix the issue before the handover. Many of the boat people had been told that the British would take care of them, or even send them off to California. First under Foreign Secretary John Major and then under Douglas Hurd, the British began forcibly flying the Vietnamese back to Hanoi from Hong Kong, trying to sequester those who were actual refugees from those who were economic migrants. For a day or two, I was treated by liberal people as a descendant of the Gestapo and an imitator of the Holocaust, but gradually the policy justified itself. The Vietnamese who returned were not persecuted. An even greater threat was posed by the Tiananmen Square Massacre, which you can learn more about in this previous video. The brutality of the Chinese government's repressive actions had shocked the whole world, but in particular the vulnerable inhabitants of Hong Kong, who were due to see their territory revert to Chinese sovereignty on July 1st, 1997. Whether the traditional open way of life in Hong Kong would be allowed to continue was thus entirely dependent on the goodwill of the Chinese government. Before Tiananmen Square, it is possible to be optimistic. After it, trust was shattered. This triggered an emigration crisis amongst Hong Kong professionals. Many didn't want to live under communist rule, so they began arranging their immigration to the UK, Australia, and Canada. There was fear that by 1997, Hong Kong would lose much of its educated bureaucrats, leading to either disorder or leaving enough open positions for the CCP to fill it with loyalists. To keep them in Hong Kong, the British government offered them the right to immigrate to the UK after 1997. Within the Conservative Party, there were two factions, which Douglas Hurd referred to as the Generous Right or the Sour Right. The generous right embraced the tradition and legacy of the empire and believed this meant being more open to immigration from former colonies. In contrast, the sour right was restrictionist across the board. The sour right conjured up a nightmare of thousands of penniless Chinese descending on Britain, swallowing up jobs, homes, and welfare benefits. Despite all of these concerns, most of the world saw this process as the best way to pressure China into political liberalization. By the time I became Prime Minister, China itself had begun to embrace the free market. So it seemed that capitalism in Hong Kong had a future. Nevertheless, it was essential to ensure that the colony's successful political base should survive intact after handover. In the final years of British rule, Major oversaw political liberalization in Hong Kong. Chris Patton would be appointed governor of Hong Kong in 1992, and his goal was to democratize as much of Hong Kong's institutions as possible prior to the handover. China had wanted the right to secretly veto any proposal they disapproved before they were announced, but if they were announced before they could express their displeasure, walking them back would be more difficult. The British weren't allowed to organize any elections for terms of office that would extend past June 30th, 1997. And on July 1st, China abolished the Legislative Council and replaced it with an unelected body, which was scheduled to be replaced with a new body. The recently elected government of Tony Blair, disapproving of the details of the handover, didn't send any official representation, while former Prime Ministers Edward Heath, Margaret Thatcher, and John Major were in attendance. After the handover of Hong Kong, US President Bill Clinton met with the Dalai Lama, as well as Hong Kong democracy activist Martin Lee. Clinton believed that letting China into the World Trade Organization, and thus opening it up economically, might change its behavior on human rights. I thought the trade relationship could be improved only through negotiations leading to China's entry into the World Trade Organization. Meanwhile, we needed to stay involved with, not isolate, China. 
The Chinese had promised to let Hong Kong keep its much more democratic political system, but I had the clear impression that the details of their reunion were still being worked out, and that neither side was fully satisfied with the present state of affairs. I'd also like to thank my patrons for making this video possible. Their support allows me to continue making videos and focus a little more on subjects I think are interesting rather than simply chasing the algorithm. To learn more, you can go to patreon.com slash casualhistorian. Thank you all for watching, and I will see you next time.